Hey, I'm Tyler Spades, and today we're gonna talk about fire spinning. And specifically, I'm gonna walk you through my dip station, my prop bag, what I take with me to shows, and how I prepare to spin fire in a public setting. So right now, as you can see, we're in my backyard. And one of the first things you wanna realize when you want to fire spin is where you're gonna do it. Uh, this has a lot of legalities involved and a lot of things to consider, little nuances. Uh, mainly, in most cities, they have their own different codes and laws about where you can and can't spin fire. And that's dictated by the fire marshal. So in whatever city you're gonna perform, you wanna first check in with the fire marshal, go to their website, give them a call. There's always the fire marshal office and see what you need to have with you, uh, whether it's a permit or certain safety gear, or if there needs to be a site inspection, something like that. One thing that you can pretty much always rely on is you're allowed to spin fire on private property as long as it's not a fire burn in effect. So that's another thing you wanna check is if you're in an area prone to forest fires uh, or you're in the middle of the summer and things are dry, you wanna check to see if it's okay to have a backyard fire pit. If that's allowed, then pretty much on private property, you're allowed to spin fire. So we're in my backyard right now. It's the middle of November and there's no fire burn. So I'm allowed to spin fire in my own private backyard. Um, I'm gonna take you through all of the ways I set this up, starting with my props, going through fuel and safety, and uh, we'll get you started so you know everything you should be bringing with you to spin fire safely, properly, and confidently. Okay, so let's start first with my prop bag. I like using a snowboard bag. This is a pretty heavy duty snowboard bag I've had with me for years. I've taken this to India, to Kenya, to Thailand. It's been all over the US, up to Canada, down to Mexico. This bag is still being held together. I own three or four different snowboard bags and have tried different ones over the years just because they have different qualities and things that are good, things that are bad. This is the one that stuck with me the whole time just because it's very heavy duty canvas. It's got a really durable, good zipper. It's got these side pockets here that I really enjoy to have different tools I need with me. And it's big enough to hold my stabs, which are four feet long. And I think it's even like a four and a half foot bag. So I can fit a ton of stabs in here. I can fit my clubs, my torches, all my things in here. I tend not to put non-fire equipment in this bag, just because if you're gonna put like your day juggling clubs in here, then you're gonna get soot on them. And no matter what, if you're putting fire props in your bag without covering the wicks, there's gonna be soot inside the bag, so it's gonna get things dirty. If I am gonna put something inside this bag that's not a fire prop, I put it in a separate bag first. So I'll put it into either a plastic grocery bag or a backpack or something that can cover that. So it's a bag inside a bag. All right, so let's look inside this guy. Today I brought with me a few things. Funnel, set that to the side. We'll talk about that with safety in a minute. Squeeze bottle, set that to a side. That's also having to do with dipping. I got a monkey fist staff here. And then I got a Gora collapsible staff here. That's just a rolled wick. And then bag inside a bag. This is a smaller one I use. You can use a camp chair or something like that if I'm just taking one staff with me or one sword. You just wanna cover it so if you put it in a car or you're traveling with it, it's not gonna get soot everywhere. So I brought with me today two staves and one sword. And then inside of the bag is lined and padded, so it's nice and covers all my gear, protects my gear for when I'm traveling. When I'm going on a plane, I have never had any problems traveling around the world with fire props, as long as you let them know ahead of time. And I like to include a note that says, these are professional circus equipment and I put my business card on it. And my business card has a photo of me fire dancing and it has my email, my phone number, my name, a photo of me on it. So all the contact info is right there for them. I've never had a problem having my fire gear confiscated when checking it. It's very difficult to walk on a plane with one as a carry-on, so I just don't risk it. Even juggling clubs have been taken away from me, mostly at the Portland airport here where I live, uh, because they say it's a club-like object and that's the definition of the TSA's guidelines for what can or can't go on a plane. 
It's very silly because it's a juggling club and I've been lucky. I've even had a TSA agent take it from me, look at it, bonk the other assistant of his on the head because it's soft plastic, say, you're fine, here you go. But I've had other people having a bad day and say, nope, it's a club-like object, it can't go. It needs to go in a trash can or be checked. So I just hedge my bets, especially when taking expensive clubs like vision clubs or LED clubs and just check them and make sure that the bag itself is padded and you're not gonna bend. I have heard of people having their staves bent because when you're flying on a plane, there's bags getting stacked on bags. So if I have multiple staves in here, they actually have more rigidity and it's less likely that one's gonna get bent. If you throw one staff in, you're kind of taking your chances that the bag itself might be bent. So be careful with that, but I've never personally had a problem with checking my fire gear. All right, before I move on to the props himself, let's look at what's in my side pocket. So I have this little side pouch here. First thing I bring with me is a pair of scissors. Scissors are great because after you've been spinning a prop for a while, it starts to deteriorate and you get these little pieces of Kevlar wick coming off. This one's not looking too bad, but the scissors are great because you can just trim that. I call it giving it a haircut. You just make sure that there's no loose strings, anything coming off. Uh, it happens a lot more the longer and older the prop is and with the rolled wicks They tend to after a while come frayed and you get like two three four inch long Strings of Kevlar coming off and you don't want to pull them off because that's just going to unravel it more So having a pair of scissors around to just snip those off is really useful in handy Let's see next I always keep with me a roll of black thread and a needle in there just because when i'm performing you get rips you know every now and then you'll find a little tear in your pants a tear in your shirt maybe a button comes off you need to sew back so it's always good to just have a roll of thread and a needle with you and that way you can repair your performance outfit on the go and not have to search around last minute because you lost a button last thing i have in here is a little bit of ninja pirate splitter I love this stuff. This is an additive you can add to your props after you've already fueled them and spun them off. It's actually titanium shavings. And titanium has a really unique property. When it's shaved small enough, it burns bright white, kind of like a sparkler on the 4th of July. And it looks beautiful. It turns your fire from being a organic fire. Like if I'm doing a set that's maybe more organic feeling, whether I'm like being a ninja or being tribal or like, just kind of wanting the flame itself to have a fire element feel to it, I won't use this. But if I'm doing something that's flashy, like a New Year's Eve show, or just like a really fun circus show that I want to be flashy or for a finale moment, I add some of the splitter to it, and it's a powdered titanium shaving that they've actually figured out a way to print it in a star pattern, very, very tiny star patterns. And the more points on those shavings, the more bright of an effect you get, the more of a sparkle you get. And it sparkles kind of intermittently, and then when you hit the props together or you swing it hard or stop it, a little bit of the shavings come loose from the prop in the Kevlar itself, and it ignites in this beautiful white sparkle shimmering effect. So I love having a bit of this in my bag at all times. I don't tend to use it on my normal everyday spinning if I'm at a fire jam or something like that, but if I'm at a show where I want to give the finale an extra punch or have a moment where you just want more light, more crowd effect. This is a great way to do it. It's simple and it doesn't cost too much. So get a hold of Ninja Pirate. They sell Sklitter. It's amazing. Okay, so that's it for my bag. Let's look at these props real quick. So the wicks on a prop are made of Kevlar. It's the same exact Kevlar that they make bulletproof vests out of, like Kevlar vests, but it's in a different form. This is a woven wick Kevlar, and it comes looking like this. This is a 100-foot roll of Kevlar. You can order this in wholesale from many fire prop manufacturers and just ask them if they sell wholesale Kevlar. Um, usually it comes in a 100-foot roll. That's kind of the industry standard. You might be able to negotiate with them and get a little bit less or you know, buy more and get a discount. Usually the more you buy, the cheaper it is. And I make my own contact staves, so I like having this around to either repair my staves or to make staves. But I just wanted to show you, this is what the wick is. 
There's different qualities, so don't be fooled. Not all Kevlar is the same. It's different thicknesses, it's different widths. There's Kevlar string, you can get Kevlar thread so you can sew your props together and repair them that way. They have all types of different styles of Kevlar wicking. So explore that if you're into making your own props. Another thing right here is I have a wick cover. So this is something I highly recommend. When I'm just taking around one staff with me, it's really good to cover your wick, especially if you're practicing with your fire staff. And I know a lot of people either don't have the resources to have a practice staff and a fire staff. So they get a fire staff and they're practicing with it all the time. But if you practice with this and you're dropping it and dropping it, especially on a hard surface like concrete, it's gonna start fraying, hence the scissors earlier. So you wanna prevent dropping it and hurting your wick. So covering it is the best way to do that. These I find are perfect. It's actually a zipper bottle koozie meant to put a bottle inside. And I order these and then I print my logo on them upside down because I'm using it upside down. And I actually sell these. So if you want a wick cover with my Spades Fire logo on it, feel free to reach out to me. I do sell them and uh, they're $5 a cover, pretty inexpensive. Or you can find them anywhere. Um, there's obviously different thicknesses, you can get neoprene, you can get different materials made out of them, but you wanna get the zippered one. So that way, as you're putting it on, you can open it up, have the zipper out, pull it over your wick, and then zip it down, and it's held on. So now it's not going anywhere, it's not coming off. And if I drop this staff, it's gonna protect the wick. Also, if I'm taking it in my car, it's gonna protect the soot from getting on the seats, the ceiling of the car. It's gonna keep everything nice and tidy and more clean. So I highly recommend getting wick covers, whether you're practicing with your fire staff or not, it's just good to have. Another thing I've seen people use is socks. You can either put a sock on the cover on the wick or a baby sock for smaller wicks like double staves or fire eating torches. You can buy little baby socks and put those on. Um, my one complaint about those is they don't seal at the bottom. So if you're spinning really quickly, it might fly off or you know it just kind of comes unrolled and comes off more easily than these beautifully secured zipper covers. So highly recommend getting some zipper cover wick covers. Um, let's look at the different styles of wick that I use for staffs. So this is a knot, it's made with Kevlar rope and this is what would be called a traditional monkey fist. It's the style of knot that it's made with. This is just a roll. A lot of times it's called a sushi roll. Um, it's basically, you just take that Kevlar like I showed you earlier and you just wind it around your staff until it's ready. Usually it's just secured with some screws going through the metal and there's a wood dowel in the middle there that's only a few inches long. So the wood dowel doesn't go through the entire length of the staff, it just goes in a few inches and it gives you something to secure these metal screws into as you go in. Uh, there's some advantages and disadvantages of both of these. The nice thing about the monkey fist, there's no exposed metal. And so that is a huge deal because when you're spinning fire, the most dangerous thing about getting burned while spinning fire isn't the wick and the Kevlar itself, it's the exposed metal. Back when I started in 2007, there was uh, not much to cover the exposed metal on the staff. So this little section right here where there's no grip that gets real hot as you're spinning. The fire goes up it, it heats up throughout the burn, and towards the end of your burn, if you touch that, you get burned. You get a brand, basically, from the hot metal. And so the worst burns I've ever gotten haven't been that bad. If anything, it's just like either a little hot spot that's a little irritable or maybe a little blister, but it comes from touching the exposed metal. And so a lot of times it'd be from doing this type of move, and right there, if this was down further and it was exposed as it hits my arm, I would get little brands and burns on my arm there. Or if by chance you end up hitting yourself with a staff on somewhere that you don't have covered with clothing, these little screw marks can leave a brand on you. I have in the past had like a pure brand of a screw head with the little cross in the middle of it. And it's because those uh, hardware pieces do heat up during the burn and those are the most dangerous thing. You can touch this Kevlar and it's not gonna burn you. But if you touch that hot metal, that's where you're gonna get hurt. The monkey fists don't have any of that hardware, so that's really nice. Um, 
They're also symmetrically round, so a lot of people enjoy that because it just has a different feel as you're spinning it. That round ball on the end versus this sushi roll on the end. Um, the downside to the Monkey Fist is it's made of a lot of different layers of Kevlar rope. And if you start dropping it a lot, as soon as one of those breaks through, it's very difficult to repair. Basically, you need to redo the whole head. You might be able to sew it back together, but that's just a very temporary fix. It's not gonna work really great for you. These guys, they don't tend to break as much because even though they'll fray, this never comes apart. This is one solid piece. The other nice thing about these rolled wicks is they create a bigger flame. The flame on the monkey fist is a little bit smaller and the flame on the sushi roll is a little bit bigger. The other nice thing about the sushi rolls is a burn off. A burn off is where once you're fueled, if you leave your prop non-spun off, there's a lot of fuel left on it, you spin it really quick. So I put my hands together and spin. I'm gonna do another tutorial later on burn off techniques and teach you guys how to do that. It makes a giant fireball and it's a huge crowd pleaser. It's always been like my secret back pocket special trick to wow an audience. And I would say it has just as good of an effect as fire breathing because you get this huge explosion of fire, big fireball, and your audience is amazed right away. Um, you wanna make sure obviously ceiling height and things, we'll go over that in another tutorial later on burn offs. But these sushi wicks do much better for doing burn offs and they have a bigger flame. The monkey fists do tend to last a bit longer when spinning. They hold their fuel and trap the fuel inside, so you get a bit longer of a burn, uh, but it's a smaller flame and the burn off is can be there, but less substantial, less of a giant poof. Okay, so moving on. I also have this Gora contact sword here, and I'll show you in a minute what I do to fuel this, so I brought it for that. Okay, so let's talk about fuel. The main fuel I spin with is white gas. It's the thing we use in the United States. I know that there are other standards for this in Europe. They use uh, different fuels in Australia. And if you travel to uh, more second or third world countries, they tend to not be able to have any type of really good refined fuel. So you'll even see, you know, people in places around the world spinning with diesel, which is not very safe super hot, very caustic. I 100% say avoid it at all costs when you can. You can normally find lamp oil, which we'll talk about in a minute, but white gas is what would be considered the primary fuel we use in the United States. These are the two major brands of white gas you can find at the store. One is Coleman fuel. It's been around for a very, very long time. The entire time I've been spinning fire, I started spinning with Coleman fuel. You can still find it today. Unfortunately, the price has gone up quite a bit. Used to be six, $7 for one of these. Now it's like 15 or 20, but you know, fuel costs are going up. Another one I've seen in the last few years is this Crown brand. It's a very similar camp fuel. They're sold as a camp stove fuel. Um, I would say out of my own experience using these and talking with other fire performers, Coleman fuel is the original and it's better. It's a little bit more refined. These are basically the same fuel, but there's a different process in how they make them. So this is a little bit more refined. It's in my opinion, a little less hot, although I don't have any science to back that up. Just in using them, I feel like the flame itself burns a little cooler, but it's also a little bit cleaner of a fuel, less oily and just feels a little cleaner. Um, this crown is a little cheaper. You can find it, but I mean, I would say put out the extra dollar to $3 and just get the Coleman fuel. So you can usually find these at hardware stores or, um, you know, your normal grocery stores that have like a hardware section or a home goods section, camping stores. Uh, look for the liquid uh, camping stove white gas fuel. This is primarily what I use. Um, also at times, oop, the label is worn off, but I use lamp oil. So lamp oil is also something you can find more readily around the world. Lamp oil is definitely more oily. The difference between white gas and lamp oil is white gas is less oily and it will burn a little hotter than lamp oil and it'll burn a little faster than lamp oil, but it also ignites much quicker. If I hold a lighter up to the white gas on a wick, it just lights immediately. Lamp oil, you have to hold the lighter to it for several seconds. I would say it's oily and so you gotta heat it up first and it takes 
five, six, seven, eight seconds of holding a flame to it before it goes. Um, it's also more oily, so if you're spinning on a slick surface, this will make the surface very slippery. So be careful, I've seen people spin really quick and a little bit of extra fuel gets on the ground and you can slip and trip. Be really careful, you don't wanna slip on lamp oil. So if you're using this, try to make sure you spun it off plenty and when you're spinning quickly, it's not gonna spit residual fuel around you. Um, it also will burn longer and less hot. So I prefer using this on my juggling torches just because it's a smaller wick, they don't tend to last very long on fire anyways. And I have a higher probability of catching the wick and touching the fire while I'm juggling torches than I do when spinning my staff. So this is really nice. Another really common thing to do, which I love, is mixing lamp oil and white gas. And it's commonly referred to as a 50-50, a 50-50 blend of lamp oil and white gas. And what that does is it gives you the quick ignition of the white gas. You can put the lighter to it and it lights really fast because of the white gas, but then it has a longer lasting burn that's a little cooler because of the lamp oil. So mixing them together is a good way to go. Another fuel you can use if you're in a pinch is isopropyl alcohol. This is one that you can find at pharmacies. So it's one that maybe if you're somewhere that you can't find a camping store or you're in another country, you can't find white gas, you can't find lamp oil. Isopropyl alcohol actually works really well. Um, it's also pretty uh, clean of a fuel in general. It's just alcohol. So um, it's not a bad alternative. All right, so now moving on to our dip station. Um, I use a paint can. This is what I put my fuel in when I'm gonna dip. And it's nice because you can hammer on this lid, it seals, and then I just put a can opener, a paint can opener right there, so I can pop this open when I need to, get it open, use this to dip, and then close it back up when I'm done. When you're dipping, it's really important not to leave your fuel exposed, so after you dip, always close the can, because you don't want somehow a flame to get into the fuel at all, so you wanna make sure this is staying sealed and safe. Um, another thing is, these paint cans are not meant to hold fuel in them for long periods of time. So I only put the fuel in as I'm gonna perform with it. And then when I'm done, I put the fuel back into these cans, wherever it came from, using a funnel right here, bingo. So I use this funnel, put it in there, pour it back in, because these cans are specifically designed to hold fuel for a long period of time. This paint can is not. The lining of it is a different material. It's meant for paint, not for fuels. So if you leave it in for a long time, it's gonna start dissolving that inner lining and some of that plastic and different chemicals will get into your fuel and you don't wanna have that happen. Um, there's many different options for dip cans. A uh, paint can is something I've used for a while, but I've also in the past loved and used ammo cans. Something you can get at a army surplus store. They're the green, ammunition canister that the army used to keep bullets and ammunition in and they have a hinged lid that you can open and the lid stays there and then shut it back down and then it has like a locking mechanism where it has a clamp that will lock the lid nice and tight and they're meant to be watertight so as you lock it your fuel is not going to spill out but once again even with that i would still recommend pouring the fuel back out of it into your original fuel containers when you're done uh, another option of storing fuel you can actually purchase fuel bottle containers. And these are nice, you can get them usually at camping stores or uh, different like army surplus, outdoor stores. And this is meant to hold fuel. So this is just a screw on lid with a safety, you gotta press down, unwind it. Looks kind of like a water bottle, but obviously it's meant very specifically to hold fuel. So this is nice if you want to have your fuel in something besides the original fuel can and take this with you. And this can hold fuel as long as you want because it's meant to hold the fuel. All right, so now that we got that, let's move on to some of the safety gear. We have a fire extinguisher. Fire extinguisher is really important when you are performing professionally. Personally, after over uh, 15 years of performing, I've never once used it <laughs> and I never want to. Um, I have heard of situations where people have needed to use it, but this is not meant to put out a person. This is not meant to put out um, your props. This is meant if there's a real danger emergency happening and like your setting surrounding is catching fire. 
Um, make sure you read the instructions. Make sure that you make sure it is full and charged. Uh, it should have a safety pull tab on it. And um, it comes with a certificate usually when you have it inspected or you buy it new. The one on this actually fell off unfortunately. So um, you wanna make sure it has that tag because if you get inspected by the fire marshal, this actually no matter that it's full, no matter that it's useful, um, it's not gonna actually be legal as a fire extinguisher to take to a gig. You wanna make sure it has an extra tag that says the date it was inspected and when the date it expires. Cause these do expire over many years. So you wanna be careful about that and read your instructions on how to use it and hope you never use it. Prepare for the worst, plan for the best. Uh, another thing that I know in Portland very specifically, the fire marshal requires me if I'm doing a public show to have a bucket of water. So I have a five gallon bucket and I have a old towel. A uh, five gallon bucket, you wanna fill this with water. Once again, this is not meant to just douse water onto a person or a fire. This is meant for, I guess, just emergencies. And to be honest, once again, I've never used water to put anything out. What I would always use is a safety towel. So this towel, I dunk into the water, pull it out, wring it out so it's not dripping wet. And a good thick cotton towel can be used as your safety blanket. It's the perfect way to put out a prop and it's easy. You wanna make sure it's damp, uh, not soaking and dripping wet, but damp. And then you can use it to put out your props. And I'll show how to do that in a second. The other way you can use is a duvetine. So right back here, we have some duvetines. Duvetine is a fire resistant, chemically treated fabric. Um, they actually came up with these uh, many years ago. One of their major uses is for use on a film set because they have very hot lights that they light up a film set with and they use these to block the lights and to put by the really hot bulbs on the lights so that they won't catch fire. Um, you also know that like uh, most stages in theaters have chemically treated fire retardant treatment on all of their curtains. Um, so. This has chemicals on it. Never use it to wrap yourself up in or to keep warm or to rub against your skin. There's chemicals on this. So you wanna make sure that you're not rubbing yourself with this and you're keeping this as a tool not to keep yourself warm. <laughs> and they also have two sides. They have a soft side and they have a not soft side. Um, they're chemically treated. And as far as I know, I can look this up again when I'm done. I've always been told you wanna to use the softer side. The softer side is the one that has the chemical treatment on it. The non-soft side does not. It's not both sided chemically treated, just the one. And you never wanna get this wet because if this gets wet, then the chemical treatment is gonna wash off and it's not gonna be as effective. So if you ever leave these out in the rain, now it's just gonna be a cotton towel um, and you can't really use it as a dry fire blanket anymore. The nice advantage of having a duvetine is you don't have to have water and you don't have to have anything wet. So as a safety, it's a little nice to just like not be dealing with a wet towel, um, but a wet towel works great just as well in a pinch. And when you're putting out fire from a prop, let's go over that now. You want to take your prop on fire, lay it down, and you want to smother it. So you want to make sure no oxygen is getting to the wick anymore. And I always do this in a few ways. I go one over the top, two over it again, three, fold it back. And now the only opening is actually facing me. So you got to be careful because if I just press down, it's going to force that fire towards me. So what I want is to squeeze this here where it's by me and use my other hand to squeeze and work your way up and press really hard on the wick and hold it for a few seconds to smother it. And then unfold, unfold, take it out, and hopefully your prop is out. If you do that too quickly or you didn't, didn't get all the oxygen out, it's gonna still be on fire. So you need to do it again, over, over, squeeze, fold, press it all down, squeeze it all together until the prop is out. So I highly recommend if you're spinning fire, you need to practice putting your props out. You should know how to put them out. You should know how to explain to an assistant to put them out. And you should always have an assistant with you. My assistant, Ember, is asleep in that chair right there. He's my safety assistant. And what I would do if I was setting him up to do a performance is I would have the bucket of water off to the side by him. I would have the duvetine right in front of him. 
Hopefully he's kneeling right in front of it, not on a chair, because you don't want them laying back and just kind of relaxing. You want them ready to go so they can step up at any moment. And if something happens, if your clothing catches fire, if something's going on on the stage, you want them to be able to respond and be able to talk with you. That's another really important aspect of being a fire safety. You want to first audibly let the person know there's a problem. So if I'm a safety and you're spinning fire, the first thing I do is I announce the problem. So if like your hair catches on fire, I'd say, hair, 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 and stand up, catch their attention. Because a lot of times they're in their moment, they're performing, they don't know that their hair's on fire. So I stand up and I don't run in at them, I catch their attention and I say, hair, hair. And most of the time, the performer, once they realize that there's a problem, will stop and be able to handle the problem. If they stop and they don't know where the problem is, but they recognize that there is one, now I can approach. You never want to run in at your subject and just like grab whatever's going on because they're spinning a fire prop around. And if you run in, you're increasing the chances that you're gonna get hit, you could be hurt, you could be set on fire. You wanna first make sure they know there's a problem, they stop what they're doing, then you approach the problem. Never just run out at them because that's gonna just make the problem worse. So from there, you put your fire extinguisher off to the side somewhere and you make sure that your whole dip station is far away. You don't want your dip station anywhere near your safety. You want that off somewhere in a safe location that is not gonna be at all in chances of being around where open flames are. Because I'm gonna come into this blanket with an open flame. I don't want this fuel anywhere near that. Um, so I think the last thing that I haven't mentioned is that you always wanna bring with you a lighter. <laughs> this is the most common forgot tool of fire dancers. There's a very ongoing joke that fire dancers never have lighters. And for some reason, it's pretty true. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times in my life I've been at a gig or at a photo shoot, video shoot, and we forget the lighter. It's just the easiest thing to forget. So I always try to put an extra one in my bag and have it in there at all times. I bring a second one in my pocket. I ask a third one to be with a friend and I give the lighter to the safety. That way they have it with them. If I need a lighter on stage, let's say there's moments that I want to light my prop right in my hand on stage, I can put one in my pocket, but also make sure your safety has one in their pocket. So if all else fails, you can go back to your safety and light your prop that's not lighting. Um, Definitely bring a lighter. I've gone on multi-mile long hikes to a waterfall to do a photo shoot, hiking in 50 pounds of safety gear and fuel and props just to get there and realize no one has a lighter, so we couldn't do the shoot. So make sure there's always a lighter in with your gear that you just leave dedicated for your gear and have extra lighters around with you at all times. Um, okay, two fueling. I think this is the last one. I haven't gone over fueling with a squeeze bottle. So with this, when I open it, I'd have, pop that open. I have my fuel inside, fill it up enough to where I can dip. It's been discussed in fire culture that a flash dip, meaning I just go in and out, is almost just as good as if you put it all the way in, let it soak, let it sit. It used to be the idea that you want your prop to sit until there's no more bubbles. You'll see bubbles are coming up and the air is coming out of the wick and you'd let it sit, pull it up, it's gonna be dripping fuel. You wanna be really careful not to drip the fuel anywhere else, so hold it over your dip can. I like having a separate, different color towel that you can clean up after in case there's any residual fuel that hit the ground or a big metal tray is nice to set your dip can on top of so that way if you do move it's going to hit a tray not any of the surface around you but make sure it drips and drips and drips until it's out of dripping and you'll notice if you're holding it straight up and down it's going to retain more fuel than if you put it to the side especially with the sushi roll wicks it'll drip 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 and stop and as soon as I do this at a 15 degree, 45 degree angle, it's gonna drip a lot more because now it's coming out of this point instead of out of this full flat head. Because the fuel will come down and then collect on the bottom of this flat head. As soon as I turn it to the side, it's gonna go to that one point and drip more. So I hold it like this until it drips, switch it around, flash dip the other side, hold it at an angle until it drips off. Um, like I said, the new idea, the new ideology around dipping is you really only need to flash dip it and let it go. You don't need to soak it for a long time. 
it doesn't really increase your burn time that much. I think it increases it by less than a minute, a few seconds, 15 to 30 seconds maybe, but it doesn't really give you that much more of a benefit to sit there and soak your prop. And it definitely doesn't change how the Kevlar wick deteriorates over time or anything like that. If you take care of your Kevlar wicks, they should last you years and years. The thing that deteriorates the wick is not fire, it's dropping it. The more you drop your prop, the more you hit wick hits the ground, especially hard ground like concrete, the more it's gonna fray and that's what's gonna deteriorate your wick over time. If you're not dropping your prop, it's gonna last you for years and years and years to come. Um, just make sure you take care of it, you treat it properly, and you're not mistreating it by throwing it on the ground. If you're practicing with it, which I understand maybe you wanna practice with your fire prop, so you're used to the weight, get a wick cover. That's the way you're gonna save your prop. All right, and then with a sword, the way I would dip with this is I would use a funnel, fill up my squeeze bottle, take the cap off, fill it up, and then I put the sword into the dip can, imagine it's going in, use this and squeeze this on. And then as much as I want, you can put as much fuel as you want, same thing, twist it around, squeeze it all the way down, hold it up and let all the excess fuel drip off. And then the last thing with all of this is you spin off. So you need somewhere safe that's not going to uh, interfere. In, you don't wanna do this inside. You don't wanna do this by anything that can be hurt by fuel. And then you go out and you spin off. You do that by either a sword whipping it towards the ground and the excess fuel is gonna go on the ground, which isn't great for the environment. So a lot of gatherings that do a lot of fire dancing now have fuel reclamation structures, which is a big metal structure, like a giant circle or a big V that you can spin onto a piece of sheet metal and that'll drain the extra fuel to recollect at the bottom. And that way this fuel is not going into the earth. You really want to avoid putting this fuel anywhere on plants or grass or things like that because it is a caustic, not healthy fuel. Unfortunately, it's one of the downsides of spinning fire is you're dealing with fuel no matter what and the least we can do is try to do this in the most responsible way, responsible way possible by not getting this fuel somewhere it shouldn't be. So you can whip this and the fuel will go on the ground or onto your fuel reclamation. With a staff, you can either spin like this and get the extra fuel off, it'll whip off the sides. You can spin like this, which is more of a burn off style and let this fuel spin off and it goes in all the directions. Or we're gonna talk in a new tutorial about burn offs and I'll show you how you don't spin off to get the big poof of extra flame once you're already on fire. But you wanna make sure you do spin off with every prop unless you're specifically doing a burn off or a trick without spinning off because you don't wanna go out there, light on fire and start spinning and the fuel just goes everywhere. It starts spitting on the stage, at the audience. There's droplets of unburnt fuel just coming off and nobody wants fuel sprayed all over their audience or their performance area, so avoid that. And then as soon as you're done dipping, make sure you close your dip can, seal it up nice and tight, and now this is taken away from anywhere near your performance or your safety zone, and you're ready to spin fire. You obviously wanna make sure you're checking out your environment. You wanna check out your height above you so you know if there's anything above you that's flammable. You wanna check out the ground around you. Make sure there's no dry leaves, branches, uh, decor, fabrics, things like that that can catch fire. And uh, be really responsible about your space and being aware of your surroundings. Okay, I think that pretty much covered all of my, my prop bag, my props the dip station, the fuels. Um, there's a lot of safety information out there. I highly recommend you check out uh, Flow Arts Institute. FAI has an amazing fire safety program and whole section of their website dedicated to fire safety and fuel safety. Please check that out. They even offer classes on fuel safety. Um, it's invaluable information. You should learn it. If you're spinning fire, it's your responsibility to know how to be safe to spin fire. And make sure that everyone around you, everyone in your crew, all of the people of the venue are aware of the precautions, the legalities, permits needed, because this all falls back on you. If you're not taking the precaution to be safe and to be legal, that is your responsibility and your fault, and it comes back to you. 
And the last thing, you can get fire dancing insurance. I use specialty insurance. I highly recommend them. You can get it for a one-off gig. They're super quick to respond. You can call them today and get an insurance certificate for a show tomorrow. Um, or you can buy the year insurance, and I highly recommend it. If you're performing professionally, get fire insurance. I've never had to use it, but it makes you professional. It makes you be prepared for the worst and expect the best. So specialty insurance and learn your fire safety and have a well-prepared bag of your props. So anywhere you go, you can spin fire like a pro. Okay, and with that, now, thank you so much for watching this whole video. I hope it was informative. Keep coming back. I'm gonna be giving all sorts of tips on staff spinning, staff juggling, double staff, and fire spinning and fire staff. And let me know what other things you wanna know, whatever questions you have about this, and keep coming back.